Good morning. Once again, I'd like to welcome you to the True Grace Gospel Program. My name is Bobby Carmen. I appreciate this opportunity to come in your home or your automobile. Uh, by the way, of CDs and uh, even the computer, uh, Facebook and YouTube. However you may be watching or listening to this program, I hope that you are growing in the Lord. I hope that you're getting something revealed unto you. You know, uh, I watch the TV every evening, every morning. All the news is about this coronavirus, COVID-19 they call it. Uh, the world is caught up in it. We are living in troublesome times. The things that are going on in our world because of this are affecting everyone's life. Every person on this earth has been affected in some manner, in some form. And uh, I hear so much uh, input about how the people are dealing with these situations and how that they're uh, doing things in their homes and all of the things that uh, they're doing and uh, occupying their time and most of them do not uh, even get along at home. A lot of them are having more so sorrows and more troubles because they are cooped up and pinned up with their families. And a lot of people, I'm telling you, just cannot handle it. Uh, it's kind of a phobia like itself that People just are not used to staying home so much and have all the restrictions in their lives. But anyway, it's going to go on, and I don't think we've near seen the end of it. And I hate to speak of things that are troublesome and things that people are tired of, but uh, neighbor, I'm telling you, I don't think it's going to end when we all go back to work, when we all get back in the positions that we was in before. It's going to keep breaking out and keep breaking out. And it's not ever going to level off and then start coming down from there with everybody back to work. But, However, uh, you know, amongst all of the conversation and amongst all of the people that are interviewed and people that are uh, talked to and uh, getting a respective opinion or whatever, you know, I never hear nothing about Jesus. Amen. Jesus is not among the conversation. He's not amongst anything of all these people's lives. I've got a few people that throw a fit about gathering themselves at a church building, but they don't even mention or talk about Jesus. Amen. It's the church. It's God, God, God. And God is a word and God is a being. But the word God and the being God has a name. Jesus. And that name is Jesus. When are we ever going to turn to him and give him the glory, the praise, and the honor, the respect that is due him? When are we ever just going to drop every other situation of life and call on Him. Put our whole trust in Him. The Lord is disappointed with this generation, the people on the earth. The Lord uh, is absolutely upset because of the ignorance of the people that are created in His likeness and His image and yet fail to give him any glory, him any respect. They fail to put their trust in him. Trust is faith. They don't put any faith in him whatsoever. It seems like they don't think God has control of this situation. Uh, I want you to know something. This did not slip upon God. Amen. God knew this is coming for what we would know as decades or centuries. The Lord knew it was coming. Uh, people, I know you're scared. I know some of you are so afraid to get out and walk in public. I know a lot of you 
uh, you're just not going to expose yourself to no place or nowhere that you think that you would possibly catch this disease. You're living in fear, and your fear uh, is a good thing in a fact that it may make you cautious, but to be afraid of dying, to be afraid of this disease taking your life, do you know Jesus? Do you know your Savior? Can you absolutely say, Lord, I'm ready to go? If I do get this, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to meet you. Uh, uh, so many people are running. They're hiding. They're doing everything that they possibly can. They're washing. They're cleaning. They're purifying. They're sanctifying. Uh, all of the things that's going on in this world right now because of the confusion of people's minds. Their mind is not stable in Christ. Their mind is not settled in on what their salvation should have given them years and years ago. And that is a, a peacefulness of knowing that you know Christ as your Savior and that Christ is uh, the, still in control of all of the world, everything going on on this planet, it's in his hands. I assure you, this did not slip upon God. It never entered in at a phase that God didn't recognize it or realize it until it was way after and way too late. But anyway, I want you to understand that God is still God and that you can still turn to him right now. Give your heart to him. It won't cost you nothing. It will not even uh, be a hard life to live the way the church world has been living it for a thousand years. The world is mixed up and confused. They're looking at all the doctrines and all the commandments and all the ordinances and all the days and the times and the seasons of weeks and months and years. Read Galatians chapter 4, uh, 1 through 10 there. Apostle Paul gives you uh, the account of what the law contained and what Christ came to do according to those laws to fulfill, to complete, to abolish. And, you know, today uh, people are still just dibbling and dabbling around with all of this kind of stuff. Uh, we don't even know it. We touch it, taste it, handle it. We pass it on through our children and through their lives. We're doing things that we ought not to be doing, observing of days and times and seasons and holy days and feast days. We should not be doing them. He did it for the Jew. Christ went through an awful, agonizing, painful death on the cross to fulfill the Jews' law. Amen. Moses' law. And when Christ himself participated in them. He fulfilled them. He completed them. He finished them. And yet, the world still gives God, through His Son, no credit whatsoever. They do not give Him any glory or praise or respect for doing that for them. The Jews are disrespectful. They keep digging up stuff and they keep doing it. Therefore, they are shunning the grace that God bestowed upon the world, and they don't want no part of that. They think that they can make God look at them in a glorious way because they observe these days and times, and the whole world is eager to do something like that that it makes them look like they're excelling or that they're... Uh, putting forth an extra effort of some kind that God is going uh, to respect and God is going to reward them that do these things uh, more than he would just another person that simply believes by grace. I believe by grace through faith that I am saved. If that doesn't work, ain't nothing going to work. Amen. I don't care how many days you observe out of a year. I don't care what your effort you put into those days to make them in the way that you think 
that you've got to observe them and keep them. Neighbor, you're mixed up. You've been under the bondage of a religion. You've been under the bondages of Moses' law. You have been participating in them all of your life. From the time that you was taught it at home, uh, you've observed days and times and seasons. You not only did that, you have added fantasies and fairy tales and you've added things to it because of mankind and because of the traditions of our forefathers. Neighbor, you have got to wake up, read this Bible for yourself, a King James Version Bible, and compare your life to what you're finding and searching and getting out of Paul's 14 books. If you're ignoring Paul's 14 books because you've heard me put so much emphasis on it, that the greatness and the magnitude of what it's worth, uh, there is nothing that will excel any greater than Paul's gospel. Amen. Paul's gospel is not his and it wasn't written by him. It was not made up by him. He neither received it from Peter or John or James or any of the other tw 12 apostles altogether. Paul did not receive anything that he writes about in his 14 books from those men, those that were apostles before him. Those were all apostles to the Jews. They were Judaizers. They were people that were respectful and obedient to Moses' law. And what you have done is magnified that. You have kept it. You've spread it. It's become traditions. And in the traditions, we add all of the elements and all the things of our flesh, the lust of our flesh, the desires of our flesh. We try to outdo one another. We ha try to have more lights, more bigger Christmas trees, more bigger presents, more things uh, in the form of a family event. Uh, it's all just hand-me-down traditions that we have learned that we should have never, ever been taught it should have been stamped out uh, back years and years ago. And you all think it's a, a time and a practice that's just uh, not very old. But I'm telling you, if you'll go all the way back in the Old Testament, you'll find it. It's all rolled about back there. And neighbor, you're ignorant to what Christ is desiring out of you as far as works of righteousness. Works of the law are not righteousness. Works of the law are a failure. Works of the law are still just what Paul called them, dead. They're dead works and dead deeds that will not uh, prosper you in grace anything whatsoever. Amen. It's not going to take the place. Listen. Those works and deeds of the law, had they brought forth righteousness, we would have no need of a grace covenant. We would have not anything at all that we could possibly lift up and exalt and teach. Teach it in the form of tradition through our children, through our friends, through our neighbors, through everyone we come into contact in life. They are all carried away unto the doctrines and the commandments of men and the traditions of men and all the lies of Santa Clauses and flying reindeers and elves at the North Pole. And I know you don't like for me to say these things about your Easter bunnies and leprechauns and all of these things. I know you despise me because I tell you of your evil works and the desires of your evil heart you're wanting me to be quiet about this. You think I say too much about it. You know, in Paul's 14 books, you will not find a page of it that does not testify of some kind of grace that Paul has learned that took the place of one or more laws. You can't read Paul's 14 books without coming up with the same conclusion that I came up with 40-some years ago. 
You're either going to accept Paul and his grace gospel because Peter does not have a grace gospel. John did not have one. James did not have one. Neither did any of the other nine original apostles sent to the Jews and the Jews only. None of them had anything for us Gentiles. Amen. None of them came in the way of us uh, teaching us what we should do and should not do as far as worshiping God in spirit and in truth. The law is not spiritual and the law is not got anything in it a uh, neighbor that will possibly uh, translate over into a grace that will save you. Amen. The law does not produce grace. Sin. Law produces the knowledge of sin. Every law was written for, in a form against the things that it's speaking of and it gives you no license of liberty whatsoever. If you're guilty by the law, you will die uh, according to what the laws that you have broken and you have come short of because the law that you are keeping and the laws you're not keeping is going to be examined one day in the judgment day and you are going to be found wanting. You're going to be found guilty. You think that your righteousness, because you want to keep a Sabbath day, you think that that is making you righteous. It's be making you better than other churches. It's making you highly exalted and esteemed more because the way you do it the way your church practices it, and the way that you're involved in it. Uh, neighbor, I'm telling you, Christ it no more demands a Sabbath day. Amen. You declare to others, you testify to others about the day you were baptized. You hold up this shield, and you defend your water baptism of whoever, whatever manner uh, of a person and whatever administration of baptism that it was, whether it was a sprinkling, whether it was a dunking in a creek or a pond or a lake, or whether or uh, not you just uh, gave your way into however and to whoever that baptized you, and that is a sacred thing in your mind, but I assure you, Christ is not demanding any type of water baptism. Amen. Whatsoever. None. It will not put your name in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Uh, there's so many things. Communion. The way that people have made different approaches and different styles and administration of taking what they call the bread of life. Neighbor, the bread of life was Jesus. He said he was the bread of life. Uh, he said man shall not live by natural bread, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. But see, you all have these form, formal things, you have these formalities, you have these traditions that you exalt and that you uh, uh, keep it in what your religion requires and you're always speaking good of those things of paying tithes keeping Sabbaths doing what you call the Lord's Supper uh, the things that have been brought into the church realm of 4,200 religions that's what you're guilty of the things that you do promote and the things that you're involved in and the way your mouth speaks and uh, great boisterous things about these traditions of carnality that you feel like are necessary and that you feel like uh, only a godly person would submit themselves to do these fleshly things. 
Works of the law can never exalt you to the place of righteousness. It's not by the works and deeds of the fleshly things. It's not by the carnal things that we are promoting and that we hold up and exalt in our church bylaws, in our church traditions. You have been deceived. The things that you're doing and been raised in since you was a kid, since you could crawl, uh, neighbor, they're wrong. Nobody is testifying against these facts of the things that are going on in our religions and in our church buildings today. Listen, that church has no more respect, no more dominion, no more rule, no more power than any building on this earth. Amen. It is not exalted because you call it a church. A church is not a plank or a board or a concrete block or a brick. The church is not padded pews, carpet on the floors, and the things that we have sitting around uh, to play music on like a whole orchestra band and a piano and everything, and we got all the people to play it. No, no. You're mixed up. The church only can come by and through the Spirit. Jesus Christ is the one that baptizes people into the church. You think your pastor does. You think your assistant pastor does. You think your deacons and elders in the church, you think that they are what the world and all the members in your buildings, you, that's what you think that they need to look to. I'm telling you, it's wrong. I'm telling you, a body of people in a carnal building is not the church. Amen. The church are those that belong to Christ, whom Christ has baptized, whom he has placed into the building of a church. It's by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Man cannot baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Amen. It takes Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to baptize you into the Spirit. That Spirit that we are brought under and brought under subjection to, when it comes to live in us, it fills us out. It makes our hearts right. It has... A correction about it that it begins correcting us from the moment it enters into our body the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God it's the baptism of Jesus Christ the Son of God he gave his life that he could minister this baptism to a certain sex of people and he died for it and you are just simply uh, playing church you're not really the part of the church. Amen. You're playing church. You got a formality. You meet in the same group of people and then all the same conversations go on and all of the routines of the church services that are run and all of this. I'm telling you, it's a routine that any no on non believer could memorize. They could come in and in three Sundays they could be just like you because that's how simple it is and that's how easy your system can be figured out. Listen, you're there for a show in the flesh. You want to be counted among the congregation. You do the things that they require to be an active member of that church. Listen. You're all wrong. You're mixed up. Jesus Christ requires nothing for this free plan of salvation. Praise the Lord. He requires that you present yourself to the uh, rendering yourself under the subjection of the Holy Ghost that's in you. You have to submit yourself to it. Your conscience your mind, your memory. It's going to be, when you receive the gift of the Spirit, you're going to be under the watchful eye. You're going to be under the administration of the sweet Holy Ghost Spirit 
that God put in you. That's what makes you a part of Him. He is the head of the church. I know y'all probably got about ten heads in each building. Y'all probably got traditions and ideas and thoughts and opinions of the way the church should be run. Well, that's, that's totally wrong. Jesus Christ is the head of his church. Amen. Those that are baptized by the Spirit, those are the ones that the Spirit, through Christ, through the Holy Ghost, is going to put things in their heart to do. He's going to condemn the practices of the flesh that they have learned. He's going to bring them under a subjection to examining the traditions that they do every year. They're going to be brought under the subjection of the Holy Ghost that's in them now. They're going to examine the things that they're participating in as far as the seasons of the calendar year go around and come around again time after time after time. I assure you, the Holy Ghost is dealing with people uh, from the moment it enters into their body. That's what it is. Present your body as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God. Jesus is the head of only one church. Amen. And you, friend, because of your organization, because of your traditions, because of the things that you so honorably do in the form of the flesh and of the lust of the flesh and the covetousness of the flesh, the things that you're participating in, the things that uh, bind you to that building and to that congregation that goes to that building. I'm telling you, they're wrong. Amen. Christ is the head of the church. Jesus is the head, and us who have been baptized with his spirit are the members of the church. Many, many members, but still just one body. Thank you, Jesus. We're, we're uh, not even close to understanding the scriptures as they've been taught in this book. The Apostle Paul tells you the things I'm telling you now. He tells you about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, above all, through all, and in us all. You hear what I said? That's all scripture. Not one word of that was my thought, my opinion, my doctrination of what uh, people ask me about things all the time. I don't give them my opinion unless they ask for it. But I give them scripture every time. What is it like to belong to Christ? That's what the church really does. We are and form the body of Christ. Amen. How, how could the head do anything without the remaining body? It can't. The body then is functioning by the whatever the head requests. That's how it is. We are submissible. We are under the leading of the Holy Ghost, the head Christ uh, and we are subject unto what He wants us to do. You have to be become obedient. Obedient to what He wants done. When we work for Jesus, that means that the body is working in a perfect form and a fashion relating to what the Spirit is calling us to do and providing us an ample understanding we're not wandering around aimlessly. We're not running through life uh, ignorantly. We're not going through the motions of a spiritual thing here without the Spirit. We have to submit ourselves to Him. He is the head. There is no other head. Just one head of the body. There is no other body I don't care about 4,200 religions. They're all wrong that don't belong to the body. Amen. The body of Christ I'm talking about. 
by one spirit they was baptized into this body. Not, not the witness of men. Not the thing of building up people by men. No. I, I want God to be pleased with me. Amen. I want the Lord to be satisfied with the life that I have lived unto Him. I want Him to pick my next every move. I want Him to let me see things and understand things as He meant for them to be. We're, we're subject to so many things. We're subject to so many rules and regulations and commandments and doctrines and things that the world requires to be a church member. No, it ain't right. The, our church, which I belong to, which is the body of Christ, which is ruled and reigned and run by one spirit, and that spirit is in every member of that body. Amen. That's what makes it up. But Lord, we have so many di uh, divisions, so many separations, so many faults and failures. We have so many arguments. We have so many things that we disapprove of. And we never have got the simplicity of praying and trying to come together on the same process, the same thought that Jesus Christ aims for us to have. Listen, what God is putting together, what the Lord is allowing to grow, is His church, not the churches of men, not the laws and regulations of men, not the commandments and doctrines to be uh, observed by putting men and women in the church by these simple deeds of baptisms, of the doctrines, of the things that we see and understand that all churches have, of communions, of holy days like Sabbaths, observing of other holy days throughout the calendar year. Under the law, there were seven feast days. Under the law, every sab seventh day was a Sabbath. Uh, we're so far away from the truth, and yet some of you glory and think you're doing the entire work of the law. You're so ignorant. You have yielded your mind over to the things of Satan. You have given your uh, precious soul that God intends and aims for you to keep. That's what this is all about. The saving of your soul. Amen. What's going to end here? The thing that's going to be destroyed in the day of judgment is not the soul. The body. The body's going to be corrupt and it's going to... Uh, give out and it's going to disappear. Yeah. But the soul. He came to save your soul. Why? Because Adam, when he was made, he become a living soul. You remember reading that? Well, we are the offspring, uh, a lot of people are, of Adam. And therefore, that makes them all have souls. When we, even as Gentiles, beasts of the field, we still have a soul. Amen. And Christ came in the form of a man, and he fulfilled the strictest of law. He fulfilled in a completeness, not allowing one law to slip that has to be still kept, still observed, or we're not going to make it. Jew and Gentile. What we have is a soul. You know what the soul is? It's the part of God that you have that makes you have life. Christ came to save the souls of men. Don't matter. Jew or Gentile. He didn't put a difference. He allowed the Jews to have a little leniency. 
He allowed them to have a certain time frame in order to learn this, to obtain 